ATA for Yarn and today I'm going to show you how to knit the dip dye sweater. So this is a very basic garter stitch pullover and garter stitch just means that you're going to knit every single row as far as the main uh, portion of the sweater. We do have a little bit of ribbing on the hems and the cuffs and around the neck but this is a very beginner friendly project and what makes this sweater interesting is that we're going to be doing kind of like a gradient stripe effect so that it looks like the bottom of the sweater, the bottom of the main portion, the body of the sweater, it looks like it's kind of fading into another color. So the first thing you're going to need for this project is the written pattern. You can view the free version of the written pattern by visiting the first link in the description box down below, or you can grab the ad-free PDF version of the same pattern by clicking the second link in the description box down below. This pattern comes in nine sizes from a women's extra small to a 5X. So once you've gone through the sizing section of the pattern and you've decided on a size based on the wearer's measurements, and you'll want to make sure that you know what size you're going to make first before you go and buy yarn or before you decide whether the yarn that you have already in your stash is going to be enough because the different sizes, of course, call for different amounts of yarn. So the yarn that I'm using is this Lion Brand Hue and Me, and this is an acrylic wool blend, and it is a number five bulky weight yarn. So if you want to use a different yarn, a different brand or a different line of yarn, you're going to need to make sure that it is number five bulky weight. And you'll want to make sure that you purchase enough yardage or enough yards total of the yarn that you're using to make sure that you have enough for the pattern in the size that you're making. So another thing you'll want to keep in mind as you shop for yarn is that because we're using two colors here, you're going to need a larger amount of one color, and that's your main color, and then you're going to need a contrast color. So my main color is Desert. And this is kind of like a warm beige. It's a very soft neutral, but it's kind of got a slight pinkish tone to it. But it's, it's definitely a beige neutral color. And then my contrast color is Bellini. And this is kind of more of a terracotta color, but it's very soft. It's not like a very bright or strong or bold terracotta. It's more of a muted terracotta color and by the way if you do decide to use this yarn line this hue and me yarn all of the colors in this collection are designed so that any of the colors can go together very well so you can pick if you use this particular yarn line you can pick any two colors that they have of this yarn and they are pretty much guaranteed to go together so it doesn't have to be two colors that are kind of the same tone you could put um, something like this with a blue or, you know, a gray. It doesn't really matter. There are a lot of really nice muted colors in this color palette of this yarn. But you just want to make sure that you use two colors and whatever colors you choose to go together with this particular collection, you can't go wrong choosing colors. They all go together. So these are the colors that I'm using for yarn. This is very soft and smooth. You want to make sure that whatever yarn you're using is not something that would be itchy against your skin. You want it to be soft and smooth and something that you would actually want to have up against your skin. So once you have your yarn picked out and you have enough of the yarn that you're using for the size that you're making in both colors, then you're going to need some tools as well. You're going to need a US size 13 or 9 millimeter knitting needle. Now I recommend a circular knitting needle, especially for the larger sizes because those sizes have um, larger pieces. The, the body panel of the sweater has a lot more stitches on it and so it's going to have to have enough room to sit on your needle. So for example, if you used a pair of straight um, size 13 needles and they are say 12 inches long, you're going to have a hard time fitting a lot of stitches onto that one needle as you're working because at some point when you finish a row all the stitches will be on one needle. So unless you're making one of the smallest sizes, 
I would definitely recommend using a circular needle. I prefer circular needles anyway, but you'll definitely want to use a circular needle if you are making um, a size that has a lot of stitches on the body panel because they all need to fit and fit comfortably so that you're not fighting against the stitches the whole time trying to keep them on the needle. So this particular needle is a circular needle from Knitter's Pride. This is stainless steel, and I will link this down below if you want to check these out. But this is a US 13 or 9 millimeter needle. And as always, definitely make sure you check your gauge before you start the project and choose a knitting needle size that gets you the correct gauge. It is far more important to get the correct gauge for the pattern than to use the same needle size that I did. So the needle size in a pattern is always a recommendation only. If you have to go up or down a needle size or two to get your stitches to come out the correct size for this pattern, then you definitely want to do that instead of just using the needle size that I said to use in the pattern and not bothering to check your gauge. So we'll get to gauge in a minute, but you'll also need a yarn needle or blunt tapestry needle. These are the clover chibi needles and I like these because they have a bent tip and I just generally prefer metal yarn needles over plastic or other materials. But just whatever type of yarn needle that you have, we're gonna be using these for seaming. You wanna make sure that you have one that has an eye big enough for your bulky weight yarn to go through. You're also going to need a measuring tape to measure your pieces and to take measurements to determine your size. And you're going to need some scissors. These are the rainbow folding scissors also from Knitter's Pride. So once you have all of your supplies ready to go, like I said, you're going to need to check your gauge. Now do not skip this step. We have to make a gauge swatch, which is basically a sample square in the stitch pattern that we're using to determine whether the stitches that you get out of the size needle that's recommended in the pattern are gonna be the same size as the stitches required in the pattern. Now, every knitter is different, and so you may use a size 13 needle and get larger stitches or looser stitches, and you may use that size 13 needle and get tighter stitches. So it is very, very important anytime you're making something that has to fit somebody to check your gauge so that you can, first of all, make sure that it will fit correctly. And secondly, you want to make sure you're not going to run out of yarn because if you have um, a larger gauge, if you have looser stitches than what the pattern calls for, then you may run out of yarn because that will take up more yarn. So to make your gauge swatch, you're going to want to make a square about eight inches by eight inches. And in that square, you're just going to knit every stitch across every row. And that's called garter stitch, which is the stitch we're going to be using for the main portion of this sweater. So once you have made your gauge swatch, I strongly recommend blocking your gauge swatch as well because blocking can help relax the fabric a little bit. And by making sure you block your gauge swatch first before you decide on a needle size, you're helping to make sure that when you finish your sweater and then you wash it or block it, the sweater won't stretch or relax so much that it alters the size of the sweater. So if you want more information on making a gauge swatch and how to measure your gauge and all of that, I have a video that I will link down below on gauge. And now let's get into the knitting. So we're going to start by making the body panel and the body panel for the front and the body panel for the back are both exactly the same. So we're going to make this panel two times, one for the front and one for the back. So we're going to be starting with our contrast color, which in my case is this Bellini. And what we're going to do is start at the bottom and then we're going to work back and forth in rows all the way up to the top. And we're gonna be starting at the hem of the sweater so I'm going to go ahead and get my end here, the end of my yarn. And what we're going to do is we're going to leave some yarn for seaming later. So I'm going to leave extra yarn here that we will use for seaming later. So I'm gonna go ahead and make my slip knot right up here. Leave that to put on the needle in just a minute. And then I'm just gonna go ahead and roll up my yarn tail to get it out of the way. So now that yarn tail is taken care of and it will not be getting tangled up with our working yarn as we go. So now we're ready to cast on for our body panel. I'm gonna put my slip knot on the needle 
and I'm going to be using a knitted cast on. If you're not familiar with this, then just keep watching and we will kind of do a step-by-step -step, um, process through the knitted cast on. So the knitted cast on is basically knitting on new stitches besides our slip knot right here. So for the knitted cast on, I'm going to insert my right needle into the slip knot, knit through it like I was knitting through a regular stitch, and then I'm going to stretch it, lift it up, and then bring it down over the left needle so that it is now sitting on the left needle and my right needle is inserted into it as if I was going to knit into it again. Why? Because we are going to knit into it again. We are going to knit through that loop now, stretch it, lift it up, and bring it down onto the left needle so that our right needle is behind and inserted into that loop as if to knit. Again, we're going to knit through that stitch, lift up that loop, and bring it down onto the needle. Knit through the stitch, lift up the loop, bring it back down on the needle. And once you kind of get the hang of this, it can go pretty quickly. And the reason we're using this particular cast on for the video tutorial, you can use whatever type of cast on you like. I would just not recommend a long tail cast on because we're already saving a long tail for the seaming and we don't want to accidentally run out of seaming tail by using a long tail cast on. It just makes it a lot easier when you don't have to worry about leaving enough tail for the cast on and the seam. So again, I'm going to knit through each stitch, lift up the new loop and place it back on the left needle for every cast on stitch, like so. So I should mention here that I am going to be making the extra small in this video. So I'm going to be following the numbers and instructions for the extra small, but if you're making one of the other sizes, then you'll want to check the pattern instructions for the numbers that you'll need for the size you're making. So because I'm making the extra small, I'm going to cast on a total of 44 stitches for this piece. And by the way, the slip knot does count as a stitch. So I'm going to continue casting on until I have a total of 44 stitches on my needle. All right, so I now have a total of 44 stitches on my needle. And this doesn't look very wide right now, but once we knit into it, it will it will spread out a lot more. So you'll definitely want to go back and double check your stitch count before you start working row one to make sure that you have the correct number of stitches for the size you're making. All right, so for rows one to eight, we're going to be knitting some knit one, purl one ribbing. And so that means we're going to do this for a total of eight rows. So I'm going to bring some stitches up closer to my needle here so that they'll be easier to get at when we start knitting this row. And so all the way across this row, I'm going to knit one, purl one, knit one, purl one, knit one, purl one. And I should mention here that I use a particular style of continental knitting. It's my ergonomic speed knitting method, but um, I hold my yarn in the left hand. So I'm going to attempt, I'm not very good at this because I do not use this method, but I'm going to attempt to demonstrate it English style as well so that if you are an English style knitter and you're just a beginner getting kind of getting used to making the stitches, you can kind of get a, a better visual of how you would make these stitches. So I'm going to go ahead and knit one, bring the yarn to the front, and purl one, then bring the yarn to the back to knit one, bring the yarn to the front to purl one, and I apologize for how awkward that is for my hands, that is not my preferred method, so it is kind of difficult for me to uh, make those stitches in this way. But if this is your knitting style, you will always need to bring the yarn from front to back when you switch to the knit stitch and then you will need to bring the yarn again from back to front to switch to the purl stitch. So of course that is also necessary with continental knitting where you hold the yarn in your left hand but it's just a more fluid motion when you don't have to bring your whole hand around. But either way whatever knitting style you're using
you just want to make sure that you are making the knit and purl stitches correctly for whatever method that you were taught. So of course when I have the yarn in my left hand I still have to switch the yarn to the back to work a knit stitch and switch it to the front to work a purl stitch. But either way we're just going to knit one, purl one, knit one, purl one all the way across this row. So I'm going to continue repeating that little pattern of knit one, purl one until I have worked across all my stitches. All right, and there is the end of my row. So that is row one. And we're going to continue doing that for the first eight rows. So rows one to eight are that exact same row. So I'm going to continue repeating those same instructions for the next seven rows. So I have a total of eight rows of knit one, purl one ribbing. And you'll notice, if you're familiar with the structure of the knitted fabric, you'll notice that the knit stitches should always be on top of knit stitches, so there should be V-shapes on top of V-shapes, and with the purl stitches, there should be horizontal bumps above the horizontal bumps below. So we're basically making columns of knit and purl stitches. So I'm going to go ahead and finish up working up to row 8, which is the same sequence of instructions, and then I'll show you how we move on to the next rows. Alright, so I've finished working those first eight rows, and you can see this kind of ribbed texture that I have here on my piece. And now we're ready to move on to the garter stitch portion. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be making varying sizes of stripes with our contrast color and our main color to gradually fade into the main color. So what we're going to do is for all of the following rows, we're just going to knit every stitch across. So instead of giving specific instructions for, okay, row 10, do this, row 15, do this, we're going to be knitting every stitch across every row. And instead, the pattern is going to tell you how many rows to work of each color and when to change colors. So we're going to continue with our contrast color because before we start fading into the main color, we're going to work a little section of just contrast color. So we're going to continue with our contrast color and knit every stitch across for 12 rows. So again, I'm just going to go ahead and knit every single stitch all the way across. There's no purling in this section. We're just gonna knit every stitch of the row. And I guess I should probably demonstrate again, if you're using the English style type of method, there are many ways to do this, of course, and you have the yarn in your right hand, then you're going to be knitting your knit stitches like this, something like this. There's lots of different variations. But if you are used to this particular method, then this, this section of the pattern will look a lot more like this technique to you. But however you make your knit stitches doesn't really matter as long as you make proper knit stitches and they are situated on the needle in the correct direction so that the right side of the stitch is in front of the needle. And we're just going to be knitting every single stitch across each row for 12 rows with the contrast color. And then we will go ahead and start striping in our main color. All right, so I've finished working 12 rows of my contrast color. And if you're not familiar with this type of stitch, you'll notice that this does not look like it's actually 12 rows, but it really is because in garter stitch, when we knit every single row across, every one of these little squiggly ridges is two rows. So this is two rows, four rows, six rows, eight rows, 10 rows, 12 rows. And as you work through this section, if you want to, you can use a row counter or some tally marks on a piece of paper to help you keep track of how many rows you've worked so far. But now that we've finished with our contrast color base, now we're gonna start striping in our main color. So now the pattern says to change to main color and knit two rows. So what I'm going to do is I'm gonna pick this up as if I'm going to start working with my uh, other yarn, but I'm actually going to hold the main color yarn here and leave a tail 
hanging down and then I'm just going to start knitting across this row. So I'm going to use the main color for two rows which will appear as one squiggly ridge on the fabric. All right, so there's the end of one row of the main color. I'm gonna turn and work the second row. All right, there's the end of the second row. And you'll notice that this very last stitch down here where our yarn tail is coming from is on the looser side. So what I like to do when I have joined a brand new color is I like to take the yarn tail of the new color and tie it together with the working yarn of the old color. So I'm just gonna go ahead and tie those two together in a knot. And what we're going to be doing for a good portion of this panel is we're going to be striping these two colors back and forth, but we're always going to change color on the same edge of the fabric. So we're never going to be changing color on the other side. And this is really handy because then that way you don't have to continue cutting the yarn, starting again with new yarn, cutting the yarn, starting again with new yarn, and you don't have to weave in all those extra tails. So what we've done here is we've created two rows of the main color, which is one squiggly ridge here. And now we're going to switch back to our contrast color and we're going to knit two rows. So I'm going to go ahead and knit two rows in the contrast color now. And again, we're going to leave the main color yarn just kind of hanging off the side of the work here. All right, so I finished up the two rows of that contrast color. And then we're going to switch back to our main color. So you can see that two rows of our main color before it made a single squiggle stripe here. So again, I'm gonna to switch to the main color and knit two rows. So I'm gonna go ahead and drop my contrast color and pick up the main color. So we're carrying the unused yarn along the side edge of the work until we need it again. All right, so there's the end of two rows of our main color. And the reason I am showing you this up to this point is because what we're going to do next is work six rows of the contrast color. And I want to show you how we are carrying the unused color up the edge when we're not working sets of two rows. Because if I just worked six rows of contrast color here and then brought the main color back up to work at the next section of main color, then there would be a gap here where that the yarn would not be attached to the edge of the fabric and then it would be loose and able to get caught on things. So what we're going to do is for any stripe that is more than two rows, we're going to twist the unused color with the working yarn every time we come back to this edge. So I'm going to go ahead and work the first two rows of the six that I need to work with this contrast color. All right, so I'm back to this edge again. And what we're going to do now, because we are not working the next rows with the main color, we're still going to be continuing with the contrast color. We're going to take our contrast color yarn and our main color yarn, and we're going to get them untangled with the yarn tail down here. We're going to twist them together so that when I go to pick up this contrast color yarn, it's kind of bringing the main color yarn up and kind of tacking it against the edge of the fabric. And so every time we work a stripe that's more than two rows long, we're going to twist the yarns together after every second row. So again, I'm going to knit across and back for the next two rows of the six. So this will be the third and fourth row of the contrast color. All right, so I'm back to this edge again at the end of the fourth row out of the six. And then I'm again going to lay this down here and take the main color yarn and the contrast color yarn and twist them together to again kind of tack that main color yarn to the edge of the fabric as I work my way up. So I still have two more rows out of the six to work in this contrast color. All right, and now I am back to this edge again and I have completed six rows or three squiggly ridges of the contrast color. So the next step will be to switch back to the main color and work more stripes, but I just wanted to show you up to that point so you can see how we are twisting the 
unused color up along the edge to keep it secure. So with our stripe pattern, we've worked 12 rows of contrast color, two rows of main color, two rows of contrast color, two rows of main color, and then we've knit six rows of the contrast color. So to finish out our stripe pattern and work the rest of the way up our body panel, we're going to do four rows of main color, four rows of contrast color, four rows of main color, two rows of contrast color, six rows of main color, and then two rows of contrast color. And then at that point, we're going to cut the contrast color yarn and leave a tail to weave in later. And then we will switch back to our main color and knit a bunch more rows depending on which size you're making. But for the size that I'm making, I'm gonna knit 42 rows of main color after that. And that will help bring us up to the point where we're ready to work the neckline at the top of our rectangle that we're making for the body of the sweater. So again, just follow along with the written instructions to know how many rows of each color you need to work and how many rows of the main color you need to work once we've totally faded out the contrast color. And so I'm going to go ahead and work through all those stripes and the last portion of the main color section. And then we will go ahead and move on to the neckline. All right, so I've finished working all of the plain garter stitch rows in this body panel. So as you can see, I have done all of the stripes according to the pattern up to here. And then I tied off with the contrast color yarn. And I actually tied the yarn tail in a knot with the working yarn when I finished with that. And then I've knit another, for the size that I'm making, 42 more garter stitch rows up to this point. So this is the end of the body panel as far as we've gone all the way up from the hem to the shoulder. And the next step is to create the shape of the shoulders and the neck ribbing. So for rows 9 to 10, here's what we're going to do we're going to loosely bind off stitches at the beginning of this row and at the beginning of the next row. And what that's going to do is we're going to, since we're going to basically get rid of some stitches here, we're going to make the shoulder area of our body panel before we move on to the neck ribbing. All right, so at the beginning of row nine, what we're going to do first is we're going to bind off stitches at the beginning of the row. Now for the size that I'm making, I need to bind off eight stitches loosely. If you're making one of the other size, you'll need to bind off a different number of stitches. But if you have a hard time binding off loosely, I do have a video with a trick for that that you can use to help keep your bind off stitches looser. I'll link that video down below but I'm gonna go ahead and bind off the first eight stitches of my row, trying to keep those stitches loose. All right, I've bound off eight stitches, and now I'm going to continue knitting all the stitches across the rest of my row. All right, that's the end of row nine, and row 10 is exactly the same. So what we're going to do for row 10 is begin by, again, loosely binding off stitches at the beginning of the row. Again, eight stitches for the size that I'm making, but it will be a different number if you're making a different size. And now that I have bound off those first eight stitches, now I can knit across the remaining stitches of the row. All right, so that is the end of row 10. And once you've finished rows nine and 10, you should have 28 stitches left on your needle. So what we're going to do next is we're going to be adding some ribbing up here around the neckline. So what we have left on the needle is our neckline edge with the neck ribbing that we're about to work. So what we're going to do is for rows 11 to 18, which is eight rows total, we're gonna knit one, purl one across, knit one, purl one, just like we did at the beginning of our pullover where we cast on stitches and then we worked some knit one, purl one ribbing. We're doing the same thing here, but we're just going to work our knit one, purl one ribbing around the neck edge. So for each of these eight rows, we're going to knit one, purl one all the way across. So I've made it across one row with that knit one, purl one stitch pattern. And I'm gonna go ahead and do that for seven more rows for a total of eight rows of knit one, purl one ribbing. And then we will bind off the neck edge.
All right, so I've finished working those eight rows of Knit One Pearl One ribbing, and now all that's left to do in the body panel is to bind off. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna bind off loosely again, but we're going to do something called bind off in pattern, and that's not a difficult thing to do. All that means is that as we bind off, we're going to do a kind of a Knit One Pearl One bind off. So I'm going to knit a stitch, purl a stitch, and then pass the first stitch over the second one. This one right here is a knit column, so I'm going to knit that stitch, pass the first stitch over. This next stitch is a purl, so I'm going to purl that stitch, pass the next stitch over. Again, knit the next stitch, pass the first stitch over purl the next stitch and pass the first stitch over. So this isn't really any more difficult than binding off normally and it's not any more difficult than working a row of knit one purl one ribbing. So what we're going to do here is just bind off in pattern which means we are using the same stitch pattern on our bind off row as we did on the previous rows. And so I'm going to go ahead and bind off all the stitches across until I only have one loop left on my needle. All right, here's the last stitch. I purled into that last stitch and passed the first stitch over. All I have left now is the loop on my needle. So what we're going to do is that before we cut our yarn, we're going to measure out and make sure that we leave enough of a tail for our shoulder seam. So I'm gonna leave that loop on the needle for the moment. And what we're going to do is we're going to leave a tail long enough to reach from the tie-off point to about 12 inches past the edge of the shoulder point right here. So what I'm gonna do is measure out to here. I've got enough yarn to reach to there. And then I'm gonna add about 12 inches extra of our yarn tail to make sure that we have enough for that seam. And then I can cut the yarn. And to tie off, I'm just going to take the loop on my needle and stretch it until the yarn tail comes out, like so. So that is our finished body panel. We started down here with the ribbing and the contrast color, and then we faded it into our main color up at the top. And now we have our neck edge up here. So what you're gonna do is you're going to repeat those exact same instructions to make the other body panel. So one of these is gonna be for the front and the other one for the back. You're gonna do the exact same thing for the other body panel, and then we'll be ready to move on to making the sleeves. All right, so now we're gonna go ahead and start on the sleeves. And before we do that, we're gonna leave a tail about a yard long. So I'm going to measure out approximately a yard of yarn and make my slip knot there. And then I will just go ahead and roll up this extra yarn tail. We're gonna use this yarn tail for our seaming. All right, now I can take this slip knot and put it on my needle. And we're going to use the knitted cast on again of course, if you have a different cast on you'd rather use, go for it as long as it is not a long tail cast on because we need our yarn tail here for the seaming. So I'm going to go ahead and for the size that I'm making, I need to cast on 20 stitches. That includes the slip knot. So this is two, three, and again, we're using that knitted cast on four and just continue until you have the correct number of stitches for the sleeve for the size you're making and by the way we are doing the entire sleeve in our main color yarn all right so there's my 20 stitches and when you kind of stretch this out it actually is wider than what it looks on the needle right now and what we're going to do is we're going to knit the cuff ribbing which will be just like the ribbing we worked on the body panel so I am going to for rows one to eight I'm gonna knit one, purl one, all the way across. All right, so I finished that cuff ribbing, and now what we're going to do is this sleeve, this right here is the cuff where the wrist is, and what we're going to do next is we're going to gradually make this wider as we go up to create that sleeve shape that we need. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to use a knit front and back stitch to add stitches as we go up. So now let's work our increase row. So for the increase row, we're going to knit front and back, knit across to the last stitch, and then knit front and back. So knit front and back is not that much harder than a regular knit stitch. What we're going to do 
is knit into the first stitch, but we're not going to take the old loop off the left needle. Instead, I've knit into that stitch, I have a new loop on my right needle, but I'm gonna bring my right needle tip around and insert my right needle into that stitch again, because you can see here, if I move my working yarn out of the way, there's still yarn on the back of the left needle. So I am taking my right needle tip after I've already knit into that stitch, coming around to the back of the stitch that I worked into and inserting my needle into that stitch into the back as if to knit again, then I'm going to knit through it a second time. Now I can let the original stitch drop off the needle. So that has added a stitch. Now we're going to knit across to the last stitch of the row. Here's that last stitch. I'm gonna knit into that last stitch once, leaving the old loop on my left needle. Then I'm gonna take my right needle tip and bring it back to the back of the stitch and insert it again into the yarn that's on the back of the left needle and then knit through that. So we've knit through the same stitch twice, which adds a stitch. So that is our increase row. So what we're going to do to add our width slowly is we're going to space the increase row, which is what we just did. We're gonna space that with plain rows in between. So the number of plain rows that will be in between for whatever size you're making are going to vary depending on the size. So in the next section of instructions, for the size that I'm making, I need to, we're gonna repeat a little sequence. I'm gonna knit 14 rows, just knit every stitch across for 14 rows, then work one increase row. So then I'm going to repeat that again three more times after the first time. So I'm gonna knit 14 rows, work an increase row. That's the first time. Then I'm gonna repeat that three more times. So I'm going to knit 14 rows, work an increase row. That's one repeat. Knit 14 rows and work another increase row two repeats, and then again knit 14 rows and work another increase row. That's three repeats after the first time that I did that. So then by that point I should have 30 stitches on my needle instead of 20. And I should also have a total of 69 rows at that point, including the ribbing at the beginning. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. I'm going to knit 14 rows and then work an increase row, knit 14 rows again, work an increase row, and follow the pattern instructions for the size that I'm making. And just remember that after the first time that you knit X number of rows and work an increase row, when it tells you to repeat that series of rows, it's telling you to repeat it this many more times after the first time. So for example, since the size that I'm making says to repeat that section three more times after the first time, I'm working it once and then three more times. So it's a total of four times that I'm going to knit 14 rows and then work an increase row. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that for the size that I'm making following those instructions. And then I'll show you what that looks like and we'll move on to finishing up our sleeve. All right, so I finished the knitting instructions for the sleeve here. And you can kind of see how this is gradually getting wider as we added stitches here and here and here and here and up here. So then I continued knitting the correct number of rows after the final increase row for the size that I'm making. And now our final step with the sleeve is to bind off. So we're going to be binding off loosely again, the same way that we did on the body of the sweater. So again, we're going to knit the first two stitches loosely and pass the first one over the second one, keeping them loose, knit another stitch, pass the first one over the second one, knit another stitch, pass the first one over the second one, and continue binding off all the stitches across. All right, there's that last stitch. So now what we're going to do is we're gonna leave a yarn tail at least a yard long because we are gonna use this tail for seaming. And then we can cut the yarn and then just stretch the loop on our needle the last loop until the tail comes out. So that is our finished sleeve and of course you'll need to repeat these instructions to make your second sleeve. Alright so I finished knitting all of my panels and the next step is to block them. Now blocking helps relax the fabric and helps it look its best and feel its best and drape its best so I very much recommend that you do block your pieces at this point. 
The method that you choose to use for blocking will depend on your yarn's fiber content. So since the yarn that I'm using is mostly acrylic, I am choosing to steam block my pieces. And steam blocking is done by steaming basically all of the pieces. If you're using a natural fiber yarn, you might choose to wet block your pieces. Now, if you're not familiar with blocking, I have a video on that, which I will link down below in the video description but I definitely recommend that you block your pieces at this point. And once we have all of our pieces blocked, then we'll be ready to sew our sweater together. All right, so my pieces are blocked and I'm ready to seam them together. And we're going to stitch the shoulder seams first. So what I have here is I have both body panels with the right side facing up. So if you look at the stripes, we have the right side of the stripes facing up on both sides. And what we're going to do is take these yarn tails that we've finished with at our neckline and we're going to use those to sew the two panels together along the side of the neck and the shoulder edge. So to do that, I'm going to kind of bring the neck edges together so that they're standing up like so. And then we're going to take the yarn tail from one side thread it into our yarn needle and we're going to stitch this together starting at the side of the neck edge right here and running a seam from here to the corner and then all the way out to the edge for the shoulder seam. Now how you choose to seam these of course is a personal preference thing. I am choosing to use mattress stitch when I am working with the ribbing and the cast off or bind off edges. But when we get to the side seams and the seams that involve the edge of the garter stitch, we're going to use a different technique. So I'm going to actually turn this sideways so that you can see what I'm doing a little bit better. So I have my yarn coming from this side and I'm going to come over here to the panel on this side and I'm going to take a stitch through the very corner of that piece. Then I'm going to come over here and I'm going to take a stitch one column in and what I'm looking for is if you look at this edge right here, this is upside down. So the V shapes of the knit column are upside down. I'm going to separate that knit column from the edge stitch right here and I'm looking for the little ladder strands in between the knit column and the column on the very edge. So I'm going to come over here and pick up a horizontal strand between that upside down knit column and the edge stitch and then I'm going to come to this side and on this side the last um, column of stitches before the edge stitch is showing up as a purl column so on this side I'm going to grab the horizontal strand between the purl bump and the edge stitch so then again I'm going to come over here and grab the horizontal strand on this side and then I'm going to come back to the other side and grab this horizontal strand. And we're going to continue stitching in this manner until we get to the little corner where the neck edge, the ribbing, stops and the shoulder edge of our body panel begins. And the nice thing about mattress stitch is that once you finish a mattress stitch seam, it blends in very nicely. So you don't have an obvious seam there. All right, so we are almost to the corner. This is the last strand on the one side, and then this should be the last strand on the other side. And you can kind of see how we have joined that neck edge right there. And we just want to kind of tug on the seam and stretch it and make sure that it's not being bunched tighter by the seaming yarn. So now because we are at the corner, I'm going to move my scissors here real quick. We're going to grab a strand from the corner of each place here because we don't want to leave a gap. If we just switch straight from seaming the neck edge to seaming the bind off edge here, we're going to end up with a little bit of a gap. So I'm going to come over here to this side and just grab this bump right here in the fabric. I don't want to grab in this space 
Like I wouldn't want to put my needle right here because then you're going to make the hole bigger and more obvious. So I'm going to grab this strand right here and then come over here and grab a similar strand on the other side to close up that hole. All right, so now we've finished stitching down the side of the neck and now we're going to stitch across the shoulder here. So what we're going to do is we're going to come over here and grab, if you look at the top of this last bound off stitch here, here's the top of the stitch, we're going to kind of fold that out of the way and grab the strands of yarn that are coming out of that bound off stitch. So there's two strands here. And if we come over to this side and look at that last bound off stitch, here is the top of the stitch, but if you pull it away, you can kind of see that there's two strands of yarn under it as well. And what this does is when we stitch them together in this way, it kind of folds the actual bound off edge here where you can see the top of the edge. It folds that to the inside. And that's a good thing since we are stitching with the right side facing out. So the main thing here is that we want to make sure we are consistently picking up our yarn on each stitch in the same place. So we don't want to come across and then pick up yarn like this or like this, you know, way away from the edge. We just want to make sure that our seam is consistent and that will help it to look very neat and even. All right, and we're down to the last couple of stitches here. So since we're almost at the edge, actually we are at the edge, I'm going to take the corner, just the very corner of the piece on one side and the very corner of the piece on the other side, take a stitch right there, and then we're going to go ahead and knot that, but first of all we want to stretch that seam one more time, give it a good tug to flatten it out and make sure that it is smooth and that the seaming yarn is not tugging on anything. Then we can come back over here, grab a strand of yarn, with the needle, wrap the yarn around the needle and pull it through to make a knot. Now this yarn tail can now be woven in because we are not going to use it for seaming anymore. We're finished with it. But as you can see, if I were to lay this flat so that the front and back are on top of each other, you can see now that we have the side of our neck and shoulder edge here. So what I'm going to do next is repeat that seam on the other side to create the other shoulder seam. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. I'm going to make this seam on the other side and then we will go ahead and move on to attaching the sleeves. All right, so now we're ready to sew on our sleeves. So what I have here is I have the body panels opened up so that again the shoulder and neckline seams are both um, in the middle and the whole piece is spread out flat so front and back are attached but they're still spread out flat like they were when we stitched these seams and we have of course our neck opening in the middle so now what we're going to do is attach a sleeve to each side of this panel so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take our stitch marker now of course if you don't have one of these types of stitch markers you can use a bobby pin, a safety pin, um, even just a small piece of yarn that you just kind of loop through. But we're going to use this to mark the center of our sleeve panel. So what we're going to do is take this sleeve panel right here and we're going to fold it in half. Now you could also just count out the stitches so that you divide them in half. But we're going to fold this in half and once we find that halfway point we're going to take our stitch marker and just kind of poke it through at the center point. Now, next up, we're going to take that stitch marker, which is marking the center, and we're going to line it up with our seam line at the shoulder seam. Now, we want to make sure that the right side of our sleeve is facing up, and then we want to go ahead and line up our stitch marker with that seam line and if you want to which i'm going to go ahead and do you can even take that stitch marker open it back up and go ahead and clip it to the edge of the seam now this is a little bit thick right here but it will poke through 
So I'm going to clip the center point of the sleeve to that seam edge right here, the seam line. And what we're going to do is take this long yarn tail at the top of our sleeve where we bound off. We're going to thread that into our yarn needle. And then we're going to use this tail to stitch the top of the sleeve to the side edge of our pullover here, our body panel. So because my yarn tail is on this side and I'm right handed, I'm actually going to kind of turn this around here so that it is going this way. All right, so the goal here is to just evenly stitch the sleeve to the body panel. Now that doesn't mean that you're going to take necessarily always one stitch from the sleeve to one squiggly ridge from the body panel. It doesn't necessarily line up exactly that way. So you just want to make it flat and smooth on both sides and then join the very edge corner of the sleeve to the ridge that lines up with it on the body panel. But you're not always going to have one ridge on the body panel to one stitch on the sleeve. So the goal here is again just to line them up so that they are even and laying flat because we don't want to have too much fabric on the sleeve lined up with not enough fabric on the body or vice versa because then it will kind of bunch and we don't want that look. We just want it to be smooth and flat so that our seam will be very neat. So again, I'm going to come over and grab not the bind off stitches of the sleeve but I'm getting the strands of yarn underneath those bind off stitches, which is basically the base of the previous loop that was, or the, the loop following that was pulled through. But what, wherever you decide to pick up strands of yarn with your needle, you want to make sure that you are doing so in the same place every time so that your seam will come out neat and consistent. So again, I'm gonna come over here and pick up a squiggly ridge. So then I can come back to this side and here's the top of my bound off stitch, the next one. And then I can come underneath that and pick up a couple strands of yarn there. And then come get the edge of another squiggly ridge from the body panel. Now, one thing you'll want to do is if you find that you end up having more ridges on the body than you have stitches, then you'll want to go ahead and stitch through two um, ridges on the body panel every once in a while. But only when you feel like you need to because we don't want to bunch the edges anymore than necessary. So we just want to keep checking. And this is why I recommend doing this on a flat surface rather than in your lap. You want to just keep checking to make sure that it still looks even and flat. So just watch how your pieces are lining up. You want to make sure that you don't have too much fabric like this on the one side or on the other. So you just want to make sure that your stitch marker is lined up straight and that both edges are still laying flat. That is the goal. You want to keep the seam flat and smooth. All right, so I'm just about to that stitch marker. You want to make sure that as you go, you just kind of give your seam a tug to make sure that it is not being cinched by your seaming yarn. I'm going to go ahead and remove that stitch marker now that I have reached it. And what I like to do is kind of slide this forward a little bit and smooth out. Now you can if you want to be very precise about this. Here's my seam line right here. I actually like to count how many ridges I've sewn into on the body panel on this side and then pin it to the same number of ridges on the other side. So here right here is my seam and I have stitched two, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 body ridges, the squiggly ridges on the body panel on this side. So on the other side of my seam, I'm going to count out 15 more and then go ahead and pin the very corner of my sleeve panel to that other 15th ridge. 
so that I can be sure that when I go to sew this together in the next steps, that I will have the same number of ridges below the sleeve on both the front and back of the body. So now that I have this pinned, I can do the same thing again, making sure that I am lining up the sleeve even with the body panel and roughly putting one stitch from the sleeve to one ridge in the body, but again, compensating for any bulging on one side or the other if there's too much fabric on one side or the other. So we're doing one stitch to one ridge most of the time with the occasional one to two on one side or the other, depending on where you need to take up that extra fabric, if there is any. So I'm just going to continue that seam until I reach the end where the stitch marker is. All right, and I am down to the very corner of the sleeve. So I'm going to go ahead and remove that stitch marker and take my last stitch through the very corner of the sleeve and through the last ridge that we had marked out on the body panel. Now before I tie this off, I'm again going to give the seam line a good stretch to make sure that it is not being cinched by the seaming yarn. And then I can come back here and take one more stitch through the same place that my needle just went through, wrap the yarn around the needle, and pull the needle through to make a knot. And that will secure the end of our seam. And I can weave in this yarn tail. So now that I have the sleeve attached on one side, I can flip this over or turn it around, I should say, and with the right sides up again on both the body and the sleeve, I can attach the other sleeve in the same manner, and then we'll move on to the side seams. All right, so I have both sleeves attached at the shoulder here, and the final step in seaming our sweater is to do the side seam and the sleeve seam. And we're going to fold this down so that both of the ribbings at the hem are lined up approximately. And we also want to make sure that the sleeve is lined up as well. So we're going to kind of fold that together so that it is matching up along the edges. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to be using an invisible seam to join the front and back of both the body and the sleeve together. Now there is a method that is typically called the invisible garter stitch seam. And what it does is it creates an, a basically invisible seam and it works very nicely. However, if you are working with multiple yarn colors, so for example, right here, if I were to stitch this all the way up, it wouldn't show a whole lot, but if I were using the seaming yarn that is this color, then in the portions that are knit in this color, the seaming yarn would show through just a little bit. So when we are working in the areas that do not match the seaming yarn, I'm going to use, I'm gonna add a little bit of an extra step to that invisible seam to make it fully invisible. So the first step is I'm going to actually open this up again and then bring these two edges together like so. And what we're going to be doing is lining up the stripes as we go along. And there is our piece ready to be seamed. So first of all, we're going to unroll the yarn tail that we had saved when we cast on. And now that we have our yarn tail ready, we can thread it through our yarn needle. All right, so the first portion of our seam here is ribbing. Now the ribbing we can handle with some mattress stitch. And this is the same way that we stitched our ribbing around the neck. So what we're going to do is we're going to pull away. First, actually, I'm going to take one stitch across both corners to join them together to make sure that the very corner edge here is even at the bottom. And now what we're going to do is we're going to pull away the edge stitch column here. So this side has a knit stitch next to the edge stitch. This side has a purl stitch next to the edge, edge stitch. So I'm going to come over here and pull away that edge stitch so I can see the ladder rungs in between. Then I'm going to come over here and pick up a rung on this side. They're basically just horizontal strands of yarn. 
and then on this side it looks a little bit different because this side has a purl column next to the edge stitch. So we're still going to pick up those horizontal strands, but we're picking up the one next to the horizontal bumps in the center, the curved ones. So again we'll come back to this side and pick up a strand from this side in between the edge stitch and the first real column of stitches as far as the one that blends in with the ribbing and again on the other side. So I'm going to continue and you can even grab these um, horizontal strands two at a time if you like but I'm going to continue until I have used up all of the horizontal strands between the ribbing and again you'll want to make sure that you kind of give this little seam a stretch to smooth it out as you go. Alright so that is the end of our ribbing section of the seam so we're going to kind of give that a little stretch again make sure that it is neat and even and not being cinched by the seaming yarn. So now we're into the garter stitch portion. So what we want to look at is the fact that garter stitch is made up of strands of yarn that go this way like a frown and then strands of yarn that go this way like a smile. That's the best way I've seen it described. So we're going to be looking at the smiles and the frowns. So what we're going to do is we want to line up the ridges of garter stitch on both sides so that they're even. So we're going to come over here and we're going to pick up the first smile strand that goes like this on this side and we're getting the one that's closest to the edge because on the very edge there's a frown bump of yarn right there. So we're going to pick up the smile on this side and then we're going to come over here to the garter stitch ridge that matches the one on this side and pick up the frown on the very edge. So it kind of goes like this. So again we'll come to this side and you can see there is a frown strand right here on the very edge. We're going to pick up the smile on the left side of our seam and then when we come to the right side we're going to pick up the frown strand on the same garter stitch ridge on the right side of our seam. And again we're going to pick up the smile on the left and the frown on the right. So as you can see so far we've gone through three ridges of garter stitch and as we stitch in this manner it creates a seam that although it is still a seam it gives a fairly invisible look so that you can't really see the seam and it kind of makes it look like this row or ridge in the garter stitch just continues across into this panel and that's what we're going for we don't want to see our seam here so again, I'm going to pick up on the left side, I'm going to pick up a smile, the closest one to the edge. Then I'm going to come over here on the matching ridge on the right side and pick up the first frown strand. And again, we'll pick up the first smile on the left, the first frown on the right. And we only have one more garter stitch ridge before we get to a stripe of the other color. So when we get to the other color, we have to add a little bit of an extra step in here to make sure that our seam stays invisible. It's not that the seam itself is visible if you continue doing it in this way all the way up through all the different, uh, through both of the colors, but the seaming yarn will, will show through a little bit. So what we want to do is make our seaming yarn disappear in the seam Whereas down here in this section and in all the other stripes of the contrast color, which is matching the seaming yarn, the seaming yarn will disappear because it's the same color. But when we stitch sections together that are the other color, the main color, then we need to add a little bit of an extra step into that invisible seam to make the seaming yarn recede to the back where you can't see it. 
So on the left side, we're going to come over here and pick up a horizontal strand of yarn next to the smile that we would normally pick up. Then we're going to pick up that smile. And then when we come across to the other side, we can pick up the frown as normal. And you will be able to see the effect of this better when we get to another stripe that does not have um, so few rows in it. This is a very narrow stripe right here. So we're now down to the next um, contrast color stripe. We're going to pick up the smile on the one side, the frown on the right side. And then again here we have a contrasting stripe. This is the stripe that does not match the seaming yarn. I'm going to pick up a horizontal strand in between the edge stitch and the smile that we're about to pick up. I'm going to pick up the smile strand and then come over here and pick up the frown strand of our matching stripe. And when we pull this through and smooth it out, you can see how that the stripes also continue straight across without really any interruption at all, which is what we want. So again, when we get to the parts with the color that matches our seaming yarn, we can go ahead and just use the regular technique, picking up only the smiles and the frowns. But when we get to the sections that do not match the seaming yarn, we're going to go ahead and pick up the extra horizontal strand in between. So I'm going to come over here to the edge, grab the horizontal strand in between, where we're going to pick up the smile and the edge. So here's that closest smile to the edge. Then we can pick up the frown on this side. Then we can come back over here pick up another horizontal strand between the smile and the very edge stitch. Let me pick up the smile and then we can pick up the frown on this side. And when we pull that taut and kind of give it a little stretch to smooth it out, it's not 100% totally impossible to find that seaming yarn in the uh, in the seam where you could see it, just tiny little specks of it from the outside, but it is far more invisible for not matching the yarn. So that is why it's worth it to add that little extra step in when we're working with the yarn that doesn't match the seaming yarn. So I'm going to keep going a little bit and go up to here where we finished our stripes so that you can see as we work up through this portion of our seam how that this blends in better. All right, I made it up here to the very top of our stripe sequence here so that you can see in the plain main color section what this seam looks like a little bit better. So again, I'm gonna come over here, pick up a horizontal strand next to that smile before I pick up the smile. Then I can pick up the frown over here then I'm going to come over here and pick up another horizontal strand. And by the way, when we pick up a horizontal strand, we're not picking up one of the garter stitch bumps. We're picking up in between the ridges here. So I've got the horizontal strand from in between the ridges on the very edge. And that smile strand right there. And then we can pick up the frown on the other side. So what we're going to do here is we're going to continue seaming until we reach the corner where the sleeve begins and it meets the body right here. So I'm going to stop when we reach this corner where the sleeve attaches and continues this direction. All right, so I'm going to give that seam a bit of a tug there to smooth it out and make it lay flat. And you can see how that when we finish the seam, even though our seaming yarn doesn't match, when we take that extra horizontal strand before we pick up the little smile on the on the left side, it helps that seaming yarn disappear back into the fabric. Is it totally 100% invisible? Not quite, but it does look neater and cleaner. And even if you know that that uh, contrasting yarn is there, you have to look closely, very closely to be able to see it anyway. So I personally think that it is better if you pick up that horizontal strand before you pick up the smile strand on the left side when you're working in sections that do not match the seaming yarn. It, I think it looks a lot better because if we didn't do that, then you would see gaps in between here 
of this contrasting yarn poking through. So one last time, give that seam a good stretch to flatten it out, make sure that it is not being cinched at all by the seaming yarn. And what we're going to do next is I'm just gonna come over here and grab a strand of yarn from the inside of the sleeve seam right here to tie a knot. And we want to go ahead and finish off with our contrasting yarn here because we're going to sew the rest of this edge together as far as the sleeves with the yarn tail from the sleeve so that it will blend in better and we don't have to use the extra step in our seaming to make that yarn disappear. So I will weave in this tail later, but first of all, I wanna come down here and show you where we're at with our sleeve. So here is the sleeve. We just made our side seam. Here is our sleeve. So we want to make the edges of the sleeve that are still unstitched line up again with the garter stitch ridges and we're going to start down here at the cuff with our mattress stitch for the ribbing and then we're going to use the invisible garter stitch seam the rest of the way up till we get to the end of our seam and like i said with this section our seaming yarn which is the yarn tail from the sleeve already matches the fabric so we don't have to take that extra horizontal strand on the left side before we pick up the smile strand. So we can just pick up the smiles and frowns only, going back and forth till we reach the very end of the seam, and then we can tie off. So because this seam is basically the same as the one we just did, I'm gonna go ahead and do this one off camera, and then I'll show you what it looks like when we're done. And of course, you'll need to do the same two seams on the other side of your sweater to finish off the side and sleeve of the other side. All right, so I finished all my seams and I've woven in all my tails and now my sweater is finished. So I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you liked it, please give it a thumbs up. If you make this project, let me know how it turns out for you in the comments below. And don't forget to subscribe, making sure you click the little bell next to the subscribe button to be notified of new videos. Thanks for watching.